Hi, welcome to the third clip of this week's lecture on the concept of society. And this clip is really devoted to charting out uh, the history of uh, the kind of focus on the notion of society in the way that we understand it in the development of anthropological theory and its origins really in the thinking of this towering figure in the kind of social sciences at large, Emile Durkheim. Uh, so he'll be the focus of uh, what we'll be talking about in this clip. So I put here uh, a picture of Durkheim, um, the picture of myself, I realize is somewhat covering his beard. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so Durkheim was French. Uh, um, he was born in the middle of the 19th century and died in the early 20th century. In fact, many people of his circle were uh, decimated uh, in the First World War. The First World War was a real kind of turning point in French sociological theory because so many of its key proponents uh, died at that time. Durkheim did not die in the war, but he died at that time, as you'll see. Uh, now, what is Durkheim most famous for? He's famous for this idea, which we discussed in the previous clip, that society is not just a sum of individual human beings. There's more to society uh, than the uh, sum of its parts, right? Society is a sui generis uh, realm of existence. It's something that exists in its own right. And it's something that because it exists, can be perceived, can be studied uh, for its own sake, right? So Durkheim was the person who really came up with a systematic study of social facts, collecting and comparing them empirically, classifying societies into different types, deriving general rules about social behavior, right, and explanations about how social behaviors uh, come to be what they are. So sociology is a discipline that Durkheim effectively established. Uh, as a science of social facts. There's a whole story there about the kind of politics of establishing disciplines in France uh, and the effects that this had on the employment prospects of people who became sociologists and were able to teach it in schools in the French system of the lycée, uh, which is really interesting, but I won't go into here. But effectively, we have Durkheim to thank for uh, for those of us who have jobs, if you like, in the realm of studying social facts scientifically, which arguably social anthropology is one of the many effects of that, right? So let me go a little bit deeper into uh, Durkheim's account of these famous social facts, the fait social in uh, French. I don't speak French properly, so excuse my pronunciation. So Durkheim provides a definition of social facts in uh, the text that you've been invited to read for the tutorials and seminars for this week. Um, so he says, a social fact is a way of acting, whether fixed or not, capable of exerting over the individual an external constraint. So this idea that social facts impose themselves upon us, operate on us, is absolutely central to Durkheim's definition. So a social fact, he writes, is general over the whole of a given society whilst having an existence of its own, independent of its individual manifestations. Now, of course, this raises a whole set of questions, this definition, like what is a whole given society? Where does one society end and another one uh, begin? And we can discuss a lot of these questions critically uh, as we go through this material. But it's interesting to see how Durkheim is defining uh, the social fact uh, in this way. So social facts, we might say, are, as I said before, sui generis, to use this Latin expression, i.e. they belong to their own genus. They have a, a their own category, they're a category apart from other things. And they're su so sui generis because they exist at a different level from individual wills or actions. You can't intentionally bring social facts into existence and you can't wish them away. And one of the really very vivid examples that one could use of, of uh, what we mean here is think of language. This is the classic social fact uh, par excellence, if you like, right? Language, right? So we can be inventive with language to a certain extent. We can even sometimes invent words. But the truth is that language operates on us. I have to be used, if you like, by English in, expression, in, in expressing myself for your benefit in this lecture, 
in English, right? So I can't um, make up sounds any way which uh, any which way I please. I have to use uh, the words, the vocabulary that is available to me, the grammar and syntax that, through which uh, English makes sense. English. Um, for some of you might be uh, a second language, a language that you've learnt. Well, you've had to learn yourself into English, right? That's because English is a social fact and it operates upon you as an individual, right? You have some scope for creativity within it. That's what poetry is about, right? Uh, but nevertheless, language is operate upon, uh, operating upon you way more than you can operate upon it, if you like, right? And for Durkheim, Social facts are to be understood as the product of collective consciousness, right? The totality of beliefs and sentiments that are common to the average members of society and that has a determinate system with a life or forms a determinate system with a life of its own, right? Uh, this is the way that Durkheim uh, defines collective consciousness. So there's this idea that by virtue of being part of the same same social group, we participate in a collective consciousness. And if you like, things like language or meanings or values or institutions are the product of this collective consciousness. That's the way that Durkheim thinks about it. Now, underlying Durkheim's uh, account of social facts and their independent sui generis existence is really an argument about different levels of analysis and an argument against what we might want to call uh, reductionism, right? So think of this in analogy to the natural sciences, just to give you a sense. So if you think of the study of me as an organism, you could approach it from the point of view of physics and look at the ways in which the fact that I'm not floating above the camera right now uh, relies on the fact that I'm subject to the laws of gravity, for example, to put it very crudely. Or you can look at me at the point from the point of view of biology, look at my cells and their makeup, look at how they form different organs in my body and how these organs um, speak to each other and operate together to allow me to live. And I can go to a different level of analysis uh, if I want to look at the chemical processes that underpin these biological um, properties of my body, right? So go down to the molecular level of my uh, makeup as, a, as, a, as an organism by looking at it from a chemical point of view, right? Now, these are all different levels of analysis and they relate to each other, but they don't translate directly to each other. So, uh, it's not that ultimately questions of physics will be answered through answers provided by chemistry, right? It doesn't help you to explain the ways in which I'm subject to the laws of gravity by going down to the level of my chemical makeup, right? Those are separate levels of analysis that may inform each other. Think of the discipline of biochemistry, <laughs> right? So these things speak to each other, but they can't be reduced to each other. Exactly the same, says Durkheim, holds for the study of social facts. So in the social sciences, we have sociology, which is the discipline that he inaugurated, or indeed social anthropology, devoted to studying social facts, which relate but cannot be reduced to psychological facts, to things that go on at the level of the individual mind or psyche or however you choose to describe it. Nor can these social facts be ultimately reduced, although they are underpinned by, but they can't be reduced to the level of my biological makeup as an organism. So social facts are sui generis also in the sense that they're not reducible to lower levels uh, or other levels of analysis of human phenomena, right? So part of the polemics of Durkheim's argument here is to try and combat approaches at the time in the 19th and early 20th century, which have sought to reduce precisely social phenomena to psychological phenomena. And these kinds of approaches are still with us today. We'll talk about them perhaps more in future lectures. But the idea, for example, of cognitive anthropology is a whole branch of anthropology that roughly says that what human beings get up to at a social and cultural level ultimately can be explained with reference to how their brains work, right? So it's by virtue of our brains and the makeup and biological and evolved capacities of the brain that we ca can even have such a thing as society. That is a reductivist explanation. Durkheim 
is flatly against that kind of form of reduction and is saying no social facts need to be studied in their own terms a very important idea indeed another very important idea that's connected to this one uh, that is often referred to as one of the signatures of a kind of Durkheimian approach to sociology is the so-called organic analogy society can be conceived for Durkheim very much like by analogy to a living body right and this breaks down to a series of ideas which are really central to the approach that he's taking one of them is this idea of continuity that I referred to earlier when I was talking about UCL continuing while we are born, live through it and then die, to put it very kind of dramatically, right? So if you think about it, the body is composed of cells that are constantly being replaced. I mean, I don't know, I'm not a biologist, but I remember this thing, I probably saw it somewhere in Wikipedia or something, that every seven years or something, maybe this is wrong, excuse me if it's wrong, uh, each and every cell in my body will be different, will have been replaced from seven years earlier. If it's not seven years, it's some other period. But that idea that the cells in our body are constantly being replaced is fundamental, of course, to biology, right? But our, my structure as a body remains the same, right? I continue to have the same bodily structure, even though it slowly ages, of course, I'm painfully aware of that. Similarly, people replace other people in society, but social structures, while obviously changing over time do perdure do endure do remain in certain respects the same and this is the question of social reproduction and that's one aspect of the organic analogy another one is this idea of function which we'll talk about a lot in this in the in the, in the next clip which is so the way that my body works is that I have different organs. I have the skin, I have the uh, nervous system, I have uh, different particular organs, the heart, the spleen, the stomach, whatever, right? And all of these things each do their own job, but they hang together in order to allow my body as a whole to function and operate, right? Very similarly for society. Societies have different institutions, right? They have the church, they have the state, if they have the judiciary to talk about a modern society, right? Uh, or they might be divided along gender lines. So, you know, female um, members of society do something different than male members of society. Or they might be divided according to different age groups. So the children, the youths, the adults and the elders might all have different roles within society. And it's by these different organs of society, these institutions hanging together, that society can operate uh, as a whole, right? Another idea is uh, the idea that societies are subject to evolution in, in significant ways for Durkheim, right? This is a contested idea. I referred to it also in the previous lecture, last week's lecture, the idea that societies evolve over time, right? Uh, so just like individual or species indeed evolve biologically over time, as we know from Dar Darwin, so social forms evolve for Durkheim. This is very much a 19th century way of thinking, which as I said in last week's lecture, and we'll see more and more as we progress through this course, has been thoroughly criticized. But for Durkheim, societies evolve from uh, uh, kind of uh, simple levels to more complex levels, right? So the transition, if you like, from tradition to modernity, a very big issue for social sciences uh, through the ages, is a transition from relative simplicity to relative complexity. And in a famous book called The Division of Labour, uh, Durkheim talks about this transition as a transition from the mechanical forms of solidarity to organic forms of solidarity. And this is sometimes quite confusing because when you think of mechanical, you think of, of machines, right? And maybe you think that that's more modern. But no, for Durkheim, the mechanical was what corresponded to the traditional, which was a situation of relatively undifferentiated social groups, where no matter which part of society you were born into, you more or less knew how to do uh, the same things as other people occupying other parts of society. So everyone can roughly do the same kinds of things, as opposed to modern forms of social organization, which are organic, in the sense of this organic analogy, that are there, that, which means that they're much more differentiated. So they have different uh, um, institutions, people occupy different roles which are not interchangeable between them as they are in the mechanical forms of solidarity. That for Durkheim is an aspect of the organic analogy uh, uh, as an argument about the transition from relatively simple forms of organization to relatively complex ones.
Now, let me give you just a flavor uh, of a, or an example of socio sociological analysis and explanation with reference to another really famous book uh, written by Durkheim, uh, namely his uh, sociological study of suicide, which came out in 1897 at the very end of the 19th century and is in many ways a kind of sign of 19th century social science uh, development uh, and the influence of Durkheim uh, at the time. So in suicide, uh, Durkheim starts with a statistical social fact. It's very much contested, by the way. A lot of people say that he got the statistics wrong, that the data that he was using was incomplete. But he makes this strong claim that there was a significant rise statistically in the suicide, suicide rates in France during the 18th and 19th century, or in, in, in fact, in different parts of Europe, including France. Significantly, he says that this social fact is differentiated according to the different religious communities that um, compose French society in, in these 18th and 19th century. So there's a correlation established by Durkheim, a very sociological thing to do, between this trend of rising suicide rates and different religious communities, namely Protestants, Catholics, and Jews. And he noticed in particular this is again a contested claim because it's such a famous claim lots of people have tried to shoot it down namely the claim that protestants were more statistically prone to commit suicide than catholics and jews and then and that's the famous argument that we associate with uh, that book he says that this can be explained sociologically it can be explained by the different levels of integration into social bonds that those different uh, communities manifest. So according to Durkheim, Protestant communities have lower levels of integration than Catholic and Jewish communities. That's a claim that he's making. So Protestantism is much more individualistic and people are less subject to strong ritual and social bonds. And this is a condition that Durkheim famously called anomie, right? This low level of social integration. And when you're less subject to social bonds, you are more likely, according to Durkheim, uh, to um, lead to individualistic behavior. And one of the expressions of this is the propensity towards committing suicide. This is uh, a very famous argument that Durkheim advances, and it gives you a flavor of what sociological, social facts-based explanations uh, look like. There is there uh, embedded in this argument a distinction between normal and pathological forms of behavior. So uh, suicide is pathological, not because it's a bad thing to do, but because it's just an ex excessive intensification of a certain trend. Right. So, for example, for Durkheim, crime is absolutely normal, uh, while the rise in su suicide rates is pathological. Crime might you might deem crime to be a bad thing. Absolutely. But it's an absolutely normal part of social process. So there's nothing pathological about crime uh, for Durkheim. It's a really important part of social functioning. Right. Um, suicide, on the other hand, is pathological because it represents an, in, an intensification, an unusual uh, upward trend in a particular uh, social activity or social uh, fact. Now, those books by Durkheim that I mentioned are associated with an early development uh, of, of his thinking. I just wanted to point to the fact that as his career developed, Durkheim became more and more interested in uh, uh, questions about the social origins of thinking and of the categories of thinking. I mentioned earlier his focus on collective consciousness, a kind of average of trends, of social trends that a particular social group shares. As he goes on in his career, he develops more and more arguments and an emphasis on the idea of collective representations. I don't want to make too much a big deal out of this change in terminology, but it's interesting, I think. And much of his late career is developed to developing a theory about how basic categories of thinking emerge socially. And that is really the big project of his very famous book of 1912, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, his most thick and, in, and kind of magnum opus-like book, where he basically tells the story of how 
basic uh, collective representations uh, develop and the most basic representation that we have is that of society itself and that for Durkheim develops through uh, 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 religion and particularly the activity of ritual when people come together to perform rituals there is this collective effervescence and suddenly they see this uh, sui generis existence of the social operating upon them in their participation in ritual and they objectify this in the form of something that represents something bigger than them themselves and they call that God. God for society is really just an expression of the power of society, sorry, God for Durkheim is simply just the expression of the power that social facts have upon us. So if we objectify and imagine something as operating upon us as a divine entity, all we're really doing is externalizing our collective representation of our own power as a social group. In another book that came out in the early 20th century that he wrote together with his nephew, Marcel Mauss, and we'll talk about him more, and I'm sure you've already encountered him in your readings in anthropology, uh, the volume on primitive classification, Durkheim and Mauss try and establish a correlation between the development of different social forms of organization and different uh, uh, social origins of ways of thinking. So, for example, he talks about indigenous uh, American societies. One example would be the Sioux, who have, uh, according to Durkheim and Mauss at the time, in their way of thinking, seven rather than just four cardinal points. Uh, so their kind of organization of space, according to different cardinal points, you know, uh, kind of north, south, east and west, they have seven of these. And these correspond to the seven uh, groups of their totemic form of social organization. Again, a form of social organization underpinned by religious thinking, ideas about divinity and totems, right? So basically, um, from this kind of blunt idea of collective consciousness, you get into more and more sophisticated arguments with Durkheim on how uh, the uh, social organization gives rise to collective representations, the categories of thinking through which the world is understood.